The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. So what do you think of when you hear the words, the castle of the king and queen? What images does that conjure up in your mind? Well, for me, I'm seeing a very big building, tall and wide and strong, and and there's a gate around it and sentinels and maybe a moat, I don't know. Inside, it's all high ceilings, enormous paintings and tapestries on the walls. There's so many rooms and miles of hallway. There are long tables and and 16 pieces of silverware at every place setting and bowls of fruit that are like the size of my car. It's all regal dress and so much propriety that you feel kind of nervous just walking through. The king and the queen might be there, but would you ever find them with all these rooms? Now let's shift gears. What do you think of when you hear the words, a cabin in the woods? What do you think of what comes to mind? It's something quite different from the castle, isn't it? For me, a cabin in the woods, it's always winter. It's always a snowy evening and the cabin is lit up bright. It, It glows in a quiet night, a little light reflecting off the snow covered boughs of the pine tree that bend toward the cabin. Inside, there's surely a crackling fire, and it's really warm. The decor is homespun, furniture hewn from the forest, lots of quilts in red and blue and yellow. No doubt there's a hot beverage waiting for you there, maybe a good book too. The cabin is pretty safe, isn't it? Really cozy. Now, when you hear the word home, what do you think of? We may have different ideas of home. Any of these could be home, castle, or cabin, or or corn crib. Hopefully, it's warm and safe. But when it comes to home, it's often more about who is there than about what it looks like. All of these are dwelling places, whether they're ones we know well and can imagine in complete detail, or whether they're kind of foreign to us. Places where people dwell, where people live, take on certain characteristics depending on who lives there. We get a certain kind of feeling from each place. We know something of the people, and it's tied up with their dwelling place, isn't it? Now then, what about this? What do you hear? What do you think of when you hear the words, the house of the Lord? What does that look like? How do you recognize it? Is it more castle or more cabin? Or is it house-like at all? What's there? Who's there? What is it like to dwell there? Well, this picture is not as clear in my mind. So I want to spend some time thinking about what the house of the Lord is and what it means to dwell there. So let's take a look at today's psalm and first consider its writer. Today's psalm is considered to be written by David, 
that one-time shepherd boy who became king for all Israel. Here, the psalmist David asks one thing of God, that he might live or dwell in the house of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. His heart is telling him to seek God's face. And in the psalm, this desire is couched in an interesting combination of words describing both David's faith and his continued need for the Lord. David knows God, and he wants to seek him more and spend more time in his house. Well, I notice this isn't the only place where David speaks of the house of the Lord. There are other places too, aren't there? Perhaps the most well-known one that you surely know is at the end of the 23rd Psalm. David's considered to be the writer of that one as well. And after likening God to a shepherd whose care is unfailing, he asserts that he will dwell in the house of the Lord his whole life long. So what was it about the house of the Lord for our psalmist David? What was it about dwelling there that has captured his imagination? And how are we to understand what he meant when he talked of such things? You know, since we're talking about houses, David wanted to build a sturdy and permanent house for the Lord. In 2 Samuel, which we didn't read today, but we hear that David, now the king, has finished building himself a home in Jerusalem, a sturdy and beautiful home built of cedar, something you might call a palace, since he is the king and he lives there. Then one night he looks out. He looks out from his own palace where he's living in regal splendor and realizes where the Lord resides. And he starts to think that he could improve that dwelling place with some cedar as well. In David's time, the presence of the Lord was considered to be in a tent called the tabernacle. The Lord had told Moses long ago how to go about creating something called the Ark of the Covenant and a tabernacle to house the Ark. And having these things with them meant that the people would know God was with them, that God's presence was among them. Well, there were some strict rules, and not everyone could go into the tabernacle. It wasn't a place that, you know, just everyone could walk into. God's holiness was there, and and encountering that in our regular state was considered kind of dangerous. So there was distance, even in the tabernacle. And the people of God moved a lot. You remember their early days in the wilderness? They wandered for 40 days before entering the promised land. And later, the ark and the tabernacle could move and be present with the people wherever they went. Sometimes the ark would even be targeted by enemies and stolen when Israel was in battle because people knew there was something special about that little place, something important about having God's presence nearby. And so maybe because they moved around a lot or maybe because God just liked to be close to them, the tabernacle God had told them to build was basically a tent. It could be packed up and moved with the people wherever they went. And indeed, God's presence dwelled there among the people, in a tent, just as God had said to Moses all those years ago. But then David, now living in a palace, thought maybe it would be better if God had a better home as well. Why continue on in a shabby tent? Why not create for the Lord a dwelling more worthy of God's presence? Do you know what happens when David asks God about this? God says no. God says no to David's kind request to allow him to build God a grander home. God hasn't asked anyone to build him a home, and God doesn't want it. Later, he's going to let David's son Solomon build him that house, a temple. But for David, no. In an odd turn of events, God says, you will build me a house? No, I will build you a house. And then God promises to give to David such a line of descendants that his throne will endure forever. And we know that that throne, that line, that house, includes not just Solomon, the one who would build the temple for God, a temple that was eventually destroyed. But we know that that line also takes us to Jesus 
the one who would bring God's eternal reign, God's reign of peace that would never end. Speaking of Jesus, in John 1, we hear that Jesus was the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh and dwelt amongst us, or made his dwelling among us. Another way to translate that is to say, the Word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. It seems in David's time, the Lord was pretty much fine with living in a tent. Now, in Jesus, once again, God is in a tent of sorts and dwelling with the people. But now, something is different. When it comes down to it, this doesn't seem to be so much about a place, does it? We started out talking about houses and buildings. But here we see that God is as fine with a tent as with a house of cedar. God's even willing to live in flesh like ours to make God's home among us. What seems to matter more than the construction is the closeness, the being with, the being together, being close and being present. I think it's this closeness that David was talking about when he speaks of his desire to dwell in the house of the Lord. David, in his life, could have gotten distracted by the building, even by building a building for the Lord. But in his heart, his dearest longing was to be so very close to God, to dwell continually in God's presence. He wanted to be always in God's presence and to really see God fully. Even for someone as close to God as David, there was more of God that was desired. He wanted to know the beauty of God and be with God and ask questions of God. He really wanted to know God. All of that is not about the place, per se, but about the person. David wanted to be close to God in all his days. Now, God's presence was sort of restricted when God's presence lived in those tents of the tabernacle. But it was still close by. In Jesus, we find those restrictions were lifted, and God came so very close to all of us. And we know in God's Holy Spirit, God's presence can be with us in all places and in all times. God still wants to be with us. And I think like David, in our truest part of our hearts, We also want to be so close to God, to reflect upon God's beauty, to inquire of God. But like David, we may get distracted by things. We might get distracted by how things look. We might get distracted by doing things for God, things that seem so very worthy. Maybe we want to give God honor, or maybe we want to prove that we're worthy, for being honest. Maybe we just like to keep busy. But we would do well to be like David, to pause in our pursuits, even our pursuits that we think we're doing for God, and to consider how much more worthy it is to be close to God, to come into God's presence. We're talking about God's dwelling place. And it could be here. A church is a good place for God to dwell, but somehow it doesn't seem like enough, right? Isn't it also true that God is very big and everywhere? Is not all the universe God's home? Are not the heavens God's throne and the earth God's footstool? Has not God made it all? And so, friends, I think that we can find God's presence in so many places. I hope that we'll find it in this sanctuary and so many other sanctuaries. But when we cannot gather here, I believe we can find God's presence in all of his creation. Just like the castle was marked by the king and queen being there, or the cabin marked by its coziness, creation is marked by who God is. We see God's presence there. We find something of God's beauty in all that God has made. 
And so friends, during this Lenten season, I pray that you would not grow weary in doing good, that you would not feel you have to add one more thing to your busy life so that you could know God more, but that your heart would fill with the desire to be in God's presence. This psalm is truly one of my favorite psalms. I just love this one because you can feel David's heart that he wanted to draw so close to God, that he knew God was beautiful and he wanted to see more of that, that he could hear his heart telling him, seek God's face. I I believe that all of our hearts do that. And sometimes something beautiful resonates with us and we think, oh, God, I need to look for more of God. And so I pray in this season when we could be distracted by doing many things, we would be able to focus on coming into God's presence, in desiring more of God, and knowing that God actually wants to be close to us. He wanted to pitch his tent among us so that he could be close. That's the same God, the same Jesus who said, I'm like a mother hen. I want to gather you like chicks close to me. David knew that protection as well, and you see it in so much of this psalm. He's crying out with his trust, but also his need for God to hold him close, to be his strength. May we also seek for that during this season of Lent and always. May we be able to see God in creation, the God who may be a mother hen calling us close into those fluffy feathers. May we be able to find ourselves dwelling in God's house, finding that that is the place we want to spend more and more time, just to be there, to inquire of God, and to reflect on God's beauty. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks for the Psalms when we can see into the hearts of some of those who have gone before us who loved you. We give thanks for this one where we can see that even David, who knew you better than so many, wanted more of you, wanted to be in your presence more fully and more completely. Lord, we give thanks that you have given us Jesus, that you have made your way among us, and that you have eliminated all those restrictions that would keep us apart from you. You have gathered us close to you like a mother hen. Lord, I pray during this season that we would seek you more and more and that your spirit would speak to our hearts, showing us that indeed you are with us, that you are beautiful, and that you have called us close to that as you have called us your own. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.